There is no end to the maxim's warning about the use or misuse of history. For example, those who forget their history are doomed to repeat it. And in many ways, the past has been making headlines more than ever. We're having debates about putting new street names up and tearing old statues down. So, if it's a live topic, what does that mean for those who teach it? And are we teaching history as well as we should? Let's find out. In Peterborough, Ontario, Christopher Dummett, Professor of Canadian Studies at Trent University. And here in our studio, Anthony Wilson-Smith, President and CEO of Historica Canada. Trilby Kent, author of The Vanishing Past, Making the Case for the Future of History. And Christina Ganev, a history and social studies teacher and coach with the Toronto District School Board. And it's great to have you three around our table here in the middle of the capital city of the province. Chris, thank you for joining us on the line from Points Beyond. I want to start. Trilby, I'm going to spend some time with you off the top here, okay? okay? We're going to start with an excerpt of your book. So, Sheldon, if you would. On the individual level, studying history gives us roots, a context for our existence. Individuals who lack that context lack a significant element of self-understanding, but also an understanding of their relationship with the rest of society. Rootlessness limits our ability to function, to empathize, to feel invested in anything beyond our own immediate needs. It also disempowers us. Powerless people become easy targets for exploitation, propagandizing, and manipulation, particularly by those who appear to offer membership to a group or a cause. Can't imagine what you're referring to there, Trilby. Anyway, your book, first of all, a beautiful book, read it, loved it. Thank you. Uh, extremely well written, not surprised. I know who your parents are. <laughs> uh, your book is an argument for our schools to be teaching history better, so let's start there. What's wrong with the way history is being taught in our schools right now? Uh, the short answer is there's just not enough of it. Um, and I'm at great pains in the book to stress this is not the fault of history teachers. There are many brilliant teachers working, doing wonderful things in classrooms across the country. This is a bigger problem about the extent to which the subject has actually been eroded probably over the course of my lifetime, 30 or 40 years. Um, where do we stand now? How do we actually, you know, what does that mean? Um, there's one required uh, history course to graduate in Ontario from high school. It's grade 10 history, it's 20th century, that's it. Uh, we don't actually introduce history as a subject until grade seven. Um, uh, between, uh, before then, historical material, as a, historical topics are integrated into a social studies program, but in a very scattergun and disconnected way. Um, We've seen uh, a decline from you know, the 1960s when history courses accounted for roughly 11% of all classes that students would have taken here in Ontario again, to about 6% in the 1980s. Um, I dread to think what it is now, but I would predict that that trajectory has continued hmm. sort of in a downward fashion. And we see it at the post-secondary level as well with declining enrollment. I am curious, you're not a no. teacher. I'm not. You're not a historian. I'm not. You've written a book about both those things. So <laughs> how, how did you get, how did this get onto your radar in the first place? A hundred percent. So I, um, I mean, history, it's, it's my first love. I studied it at, at university um, intensely and um, I then went on to, to work in journalism and uh, as a writer of fiction and, and nonfiction. So uh, alongside history, I love story and I believe um, passionately in the power of narrative um, and in the power of historical literacy. Um, and so the book was a great opportunity for me to speak to historians, um, some you know, big names like Margaret Macmillan, Bob Bothwell, um, but also, you know, those in the trenches, history teachers, history profs, curriculum designers, students, parents, um, to find out if, you know, what was bothering me about the fact that, you know, my kids were looking forward to, uh, yeah, however many years sort of in, 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 in public education where they weren't going to get a great deal of history or at least not in a particularly connected sort of um, intentional fashion. I wanted you know, to, to find out more about how we reached this place, um, you know, wh what the costs are and, and what we could be doing differently. There's a point in your book where you say, I talked to a grade 12 student and he said he didn't like history because he didn't like the way the dots were connected. What's wrong with the way the dots are connected right now? <clears throat> uh, well, they're not connected. I think that's that's the mm. big problem. Um, you know, we, we jump around uh, between bits and pieces of Canadian history. We throw in some ancient history in grade four. Um, you, you, know, you dabble in, in the First World War after that, um, and then you're leaping ahead to the 20th century Canada. There's, there are 
absolutely options to do other periods, but it's very dependent on your school, um, you know, and 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 the, what teachers at individual schools are willing to to teach. And so. Um, uh, there's a big problem in, in, in that respect, I would okay. say, in that continuity. Thank you for setting the table for the discussion to come. I come to you now. You teach history. She doesn't blame you. You just heard that. Let's get <laughs> that on the table right away. Thank you. Uh, you teach history. You coach other history teachers on how to teach history. Do you agree we need to be teaching history better? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I also agree with Trilby in that there isn't enough history. Uh, for example, in the grade 10 Canadian history course in Ontario, uh, we have 110 instructional hours to teach uh, 108 years of Canadian history. So, uh, you know, we have that, that issue with depth and breadth and uh, content versus critical thinking skills and, and all of those. We, we do need to be uh, teaching it better and it starts with teacher training programs, but uh, it also starts with the education that we receive in elementary and secondary schools and and certainly uh, I, I'm in agreement that we, we need more of it so not just better but also more absolutely yeah do, do the students want that they may they may not think they know that right now mm. I think they do I think they do uh, mm. often students come to my class with a negative view of history you know, I have to take a poll and it's typically 75% of, of students and I always ask them uh, what it is they dislike or even hate about uh, history 75% say oh, they, yes. they they don't want to take history. Typ they typically, they'll say they, they have some sort of general uh, negative attitude towards history. Hmm. Um, and, and often when I ask them, they don't see themselves in history. They don't find it relevant. Um, they may have been asked to memorize dates, for example, or they may have been taught the same things in terms of content over the years. And so uh, what they want is a more interactive way of learning history, more inquiry-based, and history that is relevant to them. Let's go to Peterborough and find out what our university professor thinks about this. Chris, when the students who take history from you get to you, how well educated do you think they are when they arrive in your class? Um, I mean, obviously it depends on the student. Uh, I wish that they knew a lot more history. I wish they had a lot more just background knowledge. I wish they had more stories to draw from. I, I loved uh, uh, Trilby's book and I love the idea of of repeating many stories again and again, three or four times. I think students learn like like making a snowball, right? You kind of, you keep rolling your snowman, you keep rolling it, rolling it, it picks up more and more each time you learn it. We all know this from stories we hear again and again, and we learn different things each time. So I wish they knew more, some do, but they don't tend to know it from school. They tend to know it from, well, right now it's they listen to podcasts or YouTube channels and they they you know they just pick it up. Uh, and, and I love that, I love that. And, it, and they're able to do, so much more when they have that kind of core core knowledge. I'm gonna suggest another reason they know the history they know is because of this guy. Anthony Wilson Smith heads Historica Canada. They do those minutes on television, uh, those heritage minutes, which millions of people watch and which are terrific. You don't mind if I say bite-sized, right? Because they're a minute long That's or so. They are. they are. That's where we learn a lot of history. So you come to this discussion with that background. Do you agree that we're not teaching history properly? Yeah, you know, Steve, the Globe used to have a, what I thought was a terrific tagline for their product, which was simply that context is everything. Read the Globe. Mm -hmm. Context is everything, you know. Part of it is if you only focus on dates, you have to have dates, but, but you lose that sense of what makes history interesting, which is the people, right? When you talk about one of our most successful programs is putting veterans in schools to talk about their experiences. So the kids get in, they don't say what date did this happen or what was the geographical significance. It's like, what was it like to land on the beach? What was it like when your best friend was shot several feet from you to have the bullets whizzing over your head to know the enemy was just kind of like, just like you out there. It's the real ground level stuff that gets them. And the magic of the minutes when they work, and we still get about 8 million views every time in the first month, every time we release one, is people looking and saying, oh yeah, they were just, you know, they were like me. You know, I mean, they were, you know, maybe their clothes were different, the styles were different, the speech was different, but their hopes, their fears, their dreams, those were the same. That's the magic. Which was the most viewed minute so far? We have done very well on, uh, particularly on the release of one marking the 50, 75th anniversary of D-Day several years ago about a soldier from New Brunswick who actually was killed on D-Day and he was 39 years old at the time and that had about uh, 9 million views in 30 days alone and I think we're at about 15 million now. Hmm. And then they just keep pumping away, you know, the early ones, everyone is, everyone smells burnt toast, Steve, still, you know, and that's about 30 years back but they're still smelling it. <laughs> they're really good. I gotta yeah. say, they're really good. They it's, do the job. You know, it's the budget of a major motion picture mm -hmm. and, and sort of the plot line 
broken down to a minute. And the whole idea, again, is to, you know, to open a door, to have somebody say, I never knew that, that's so cool, that's got my attention. And then they get in, then they want history, then they want to hear more about it, then they go down the rabbit hole in the very best of ways. Christina, let me pick up on something that Anthony just talked about, which is this whole issue of chronology and dates and places and times and all of that. And I know, you know, I got kids too. I understand that they don't necessarily love having to commit all that stuff to memory. What's your take on the importance of all of that? Dates are important to contextualize and to ground students in an understanding of history. But um, what I found in, in my practice, and certainly there's a movement towards thematic teaching of history, and Historica does a very good job of supporting that, that kind of teaching when students are learning around themes and patterns. Uh, and there's still a chronology because I think that that's how we all think and we need to know what happened first, second, third, etc. But really history is about uh, contextualizing and about determining patterns and trends and being able to see uh, the bigger picture, the macro, as well as the micro. Chris Dummett, I want to ask you, when your students come to you, again, I'm going to go back to this example here, when they come to you and you say to them, 1867, 1914, 1939, do they understand the significance of those years? Uh, I mean, some do. I, I, I think the dates are the wrong way into it. You have to have the dates, but it's the stories around the dates. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I, I think what uh, we were just talking about, about, about the soldier on D-Day, 1944, what does that matter if you don't have that story? 1867, you know, I, I begin, uh, I'll get this podcast and I begin an episode about uh, uh, George, George Etienne Cartier, who obviously was a father of Confederation. He was around in 1867, very responsible for 1867. But, you know, I begin the, the podcast with him fighting a duel uh, about, about, about a decade and a half earlier. And this guy is, you know, getting up at dawn with pistols and going out. Uh, and it's, it's a huge cha chaotic story. And I think, uh, I think that's a story that people will remember. And then the date comes second. Uh, and then you'll have some 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 flesh on 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 the very you know meager bone of that date. Trilby, how about you? The issue of chronology, dates, times, places. Yeah. How important to you? Um, I think they they do matter for the reasons you know, Christina and 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 Christopher have have outlined. Um, I do think that having some sense of the big picture, the you know the broad sweep of history is really important. Um, one of the people I spoke to for the book was Professor Bob Bain, who's involved in the Big History Project um, and its successor, the World History Project, which are these this really exciting brainchild of Dr. David Christian. I watch his TED Talk, incidentally. You watch his TED you, Talk. Because you mention it in the book. Yes. David Christian's TED Talk. The history of the, the world. The history of the whole in, world. Exactly. In 20 minutes. And how many people, like 10 million people have watched that watch thing. Watch it, yeah. loads and loads and loads of hits. And so, so this is the thing. So what we need to you know, be focusing on constantly is tacking back and forth between uh, that broad chronology um, and the details and, and asking, you know, does the evidence support that broad, um, you know, the broad narrative, the big story that we're telling? Um, but, you know, one example that, that Professor Bain gave was, you know, trying to piece together a thousand piece puzzle without reference to the picture on the front of the box. Mm -hmm. If we don't have that, that sense of chronology of, of, of big picture, then really dealing in micro histories and themes um, is only going to get us so far. It's only going to result in a piecemeal understanding of, of the subject. Mm. You, grew, you grew up in Montreal, yes? Yeah. So you grew up as an Anglophone in a mostly Francophone province, therefore presumably learning a different history in your school system than the Francophone kids would have learned. Which makes me wonder, if my premise is right, makes me wonder, is it possible to teach a common history in a bilingual, multicultural country? Well, apparently not, because it's really not done. The other reminder, Steve, of course, is that if, you know, there's only four of the 13 provinces and territories teach history as such, although a few more have social sciences and things within. But yeah, we learned a much different, you know, while they were learning about Dollard and otherwise, we were learning about the British Army. I mean, we thought the British Army were the heroes on the Plains of Abraham. They didn't. That <laughs> continues in many ways to define Quebec, as we saw in the election a couple of days ago. Um, you know, we lack a national narrative, and that's both good and bad. The value of a national narrative, I think, is fairly self-evident. You grow up with a greater sense of country. On the other hand, you tend to create uh, some false idols and um, things are less questioned, you know, and now as we are, I mean, what you learn in Manitoba is much, much different than what you're learning in, you know, in Ontario. And your knowledge of things like, to take a specific, I'm sure we'll talk about black history, well, if you're in the Maritimes, you know a whole lot more in Ontario than you do if you're out west about that, and that's a whole. Can I pick up on that with you? Because certainly, un until relatively recently, black history was a very underserved area of history taught. Uh, 
Women's role in history would be another example of something that was uh, not taught as much. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you dealing with all of that in high school? Well, we had a curriculum revision uh, in recent years, but it's it's still not sufficient. It covers the uh, history of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, uh, but there is no specific overall. There is no overall expectation, for example, in the curriculum in Ontario that addresses Black history or women's history. It's, it's sort of very general how different groups uh, within the land we live on experience different events. Um, but we are really trying to investigate and introduce our students to untold and undertold stories because. I guess that is an advantage in the same way in that our overall expectations are so broad that we can bring it in. Uh, but of course, our teacher training programs have to catch up to that. And, and teachers mm. also have to be able to access those resources and be able to find them. So that becomes the challenge. Where do we find these stories? Because what we want to do is to spark joy and curiosity in our students by introducing them to these stories. And I think that's the role of the, the educator, the practitioner on the field, is to bring these stories to them because the internet is rife with all all kinds of, of stories, but for students to access them, they need someone to facilitate and guide and make sure that their story is also represented in the story of Canadian history. If, if it's, I don't know, you tell me, is it the case that if you're a young, let's say you're a young black kid in elementary school in the province of Ontario, and you're learning about old white men from 150 years ago, is that just something that's not going to resonate with you? Not necessarily. I think we need to have an inclusive story of Canadian history that includes all of the voices. So those stories are, are important. They are, they are important to our story of Canadian history, but we need to look at telling the truth, right? We're in an area of truth. We're in an era of truth and reconciliation. And our role as educators is also to tell a truthful Canadian history, which means bringing in all of those narratives and making it relevant to that young black boy, but also all of the students that we serve in a multicultural society or classroom, particularly in, in Toronto, we are. Chris Dummett, is there a way to frame Canadian history in a, in, in a way where everybody sort of sees that they've got a piece of it or a piece in it? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the danger is in emphasizing too much differences and assuming that the kinds of things that we see now, you know, whether it's skin color or other things, are inherently all, are always going to matter. You know, I, I spent a, a chunk of last year reading um, 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 Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, right? There's a Roman emperor in uh, the early part of the uh, 2000 years ago. And I'm not Italian, I'm certainly not a Roman emperor. And, and yet when I read that book, it's just astoundingly relevant and you see yourself in it because it's, it's such a human story. And I think when history is done right, uh, and you get into these human stories and you teach them right, people will see themselves in these predicaments that we all face as humans. Trilby, what do they do in Australia? What do they do in Australia? Well, the exciting news from Australia is that they've actually identified history as one of the four pillars of education. They've had a, a, that, that, that national conversation, which is what I would love to see us, us do here. Um, and it wasn't always pretty. Uh, you know, the, the history wars years were, you know, were, were complicated, but they've reached a point where they're, they've come to the agreement that history matters. And I think that that's the first step. Um, a diverse and inclusive history matters, and we have to expand explode the old master narratives and try and, you know, piece together something that includes a range of voices and perspectives. And that's not easy. Um, but Australia, as long, uh, uh, along with countries as diverse as um, Germany, uh, Sweden, Japan, they've all managed to agree on a cumulative uh, elementary, at least, history curriculum, um, which is something that I think we lack. You know, we teach math year on year from grade one to grade 12. Mm -hmm. um, it seems obvious that you know, we should do the same thing with, with history as well. But in Australia, um, you've got to take it all the way to the end of high school? I don't know that it's required all the way to the end of high school. It's certainly in the first few years, and they've certainly said we set it as, as a priority. Should um, we and do this that? Is, yes. We yeah, should do that. Absolutely, 100%. Mm. It's something, of, of course, that, you know, uh, changes every few years. It's according to the capricious whims of who's in power and mm. who's in the Ministry of Education and so on. Um, so, you know, what was true last year may not be true next year, but I think this is um, this is a project that, uh, you know, is, is worth taking on and, and it's worth investing that time. Anthony, there's a lot of cooks in this kitchen. You got the Ministry of Education, you got yeah. school boards, you got teachers, you got parents, you got students, and everybody's got a good idea about what ought to or ought not to happen. As you look around, who... Who do you blame? Who do you praise? Who do you blame for because it's this bad? Who do you praise because at least it's as good as it is? Well, I think the essence is sort of the philosophy, Stephen. I think really there's sort of four pieces to the arc of Canadian history. One is that this has been indisputably an absolutely great nation for the, probably the overwhelming majority of people who were born here or who have come here. 
The second part of that is that we have failed miserably in our dealings with certain groups, most notably indigenous, of course, and, and black people, other people of color as well. The other things are that demonstrably through our history, human rights issues, equality issues have, have improved significantly in almost pretty much every field that you look at. The final piece of that, though, is having said that, they're nowhere near where they should be or where we need them to be in coming years. So it's, you know, it's a, a sort of a sweep of great successes marked by notable failures in certain areas, and that's the way that we have to tackle that now. You can't only focus on failure. You can't only focus on saying, look at us, we're so great. Okay, Chris Tumman, how about you? Where do, where do you like to point the finger at, if only these folks would pull up their socks, we'd have a better, educa a better educated populace when it comes to history? Well, I, I won't. I won't. I, I won't take on the whole question. I would say, in my world in the university, I think the dilemma is actually slightly different from what uh, Anthony Wilson well, Smith was just saying. I think the dilemma is a kind of a kind of over uh, over critical approach, which is has tended in its kind of over criticism to be somewhat parochial. Uh, so it's, it's what, uh, you know, Roger Scruton, the British philosopher, called a, a kind of oikophobic approach, by which he meant the opposite of xenophobic, so not a dislike of foreigners, but a dislike of the self, a dislike of our own culture. And, you know, I think this is a, this is a genuine problem in university history teaching uh, today in the sense that there's, a, there's an incredible focus on the, 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 the you know, the, the sins of Canada in, in a kind, almost, almost in a vacuum. Um, I'm struck, struck by the the talking about the need to teach the Atlantic slave trade, which of course we did, and it's a fascinating and fundamentally important topic. But you rarely hear people want to talk about the Islamic slave trade that that you know sent you know almost e even more slaves up uh, uh, up Africa into the Middle East. It's an incredibly important topic, really unheard of in North America when we're so focused on just our own stories. And why do you think we don't teach th that aspect of the story? Well, I would say in the university world, it doesn't it doesn't criticize Canada, uh, and and it's just if if you're so focused on present you know political slash moral goals, then that story doesn't fit your does not fit to purpose. Christina, when you're in the staff lounge, and you're go not gossiping, I won't say gossip. When you're having a <laughs> serious <laughs> when you're having a serious intellectual discussion with your colleagues about that damn ministry or that damn school board or those damn parents or those bratty kids or something, who who do you look to and say? We'd be doing so much better if not for what group? I don't know that I would necessarily lay the blame at uh, any, any one group, but certainly going back to how we started this conversation, uh, we certainly need to start history earlier, uh, earlier on in elementary school. I how have early? Children, I have children in grade two and grade four that early. Uh, grade two, I would say, there, there is no reason to, start, to not start that, that story. They, they learn all kinds of stories, and my students are very fortunate. They have uh, you know, wonderful teachers at a wonderful school. They're learning, they had Orange Shirt Day and Truth and Reconciliation. Mm -hmm. They know all the calls to action, uh, which is wonderful. But uh, to have it mandated and specifically implemented in the curriculum, you know, grade one all the way up to grade eight, so that students have this big picture that they can come to high school um, with all of that context, and then we can really get into those stories and those narratives and the big arc and the small stories of, of mm -hmm. Canadian history, and perhaps they would continue to uh, to further their studies in post-secondary, and, and we would see that enrollment go up. They certainly play video games in grade two, don't they? Uh, I, not my son, but oh. <laughs> some other lucky kids Because I, I mean, I, I, I do know kids who've yeah, played yeah. Uh, war video games, and that's oh, how they've okay. learned places and dates of yeah. uh, World War II battles and so on, yeah. by playing video games. Yeah, so. gamified learning is... Uh, it's Oregon certainly trail. one way to do it, yes. yes. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> now, okay, I want to take uh, advantage of your being here to, <laughs> to ask this next question because you, you, you had some interactions with the Ontario Ministry of Education when you wrote the book, and you tried to ask them, why do we teach the way we teach and what we teach and when we teach it and all of that? And I noticed, I think you, you, you replicated the entire response that you got from a bureaucrat in the Ministry of Education, and it was a long, very thorough answer. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the answer? Um, it was a long answer. Mm. Um, I don't know that it particularly addressed any of the questions that I Well, that's that what I, I was going to ask. Was it on point? <laughs> uh, not really. I mean, it was, it was a boilerplate kind of summary of the status quo. Um, and so I think, you know, you're asking, I'm not so interested in saying, you know, who do we blame here, but rather, you know, where will change occur? Where will mm -hmm. it come from? Um, and you know the bad news is the, the political divide between ministries of education, teachers' unions is you know perhaps too wide you know for this conversation to really get started there. Um, the good news is public engagement with history, interest in history, I think has probably never been 
as high as, as it is today, particularly because we've just come through, you know, a global pandemic and we're watching war in Ukraine evolve. We're having conversations about the legacy of institutionalized racism and slavery, the 1619 Project in the States, that sort of thing. Um, I think if there is enough of a groundswell of, of uh, you know, from students, from teachers, from histor practicing historians themselves to say, you know, this matters. This is a conversation that we want to, we want to have. Um, that's, that's how change is, is going to come about. We can't wait for it to come trickle down from the top because the political will probably isn't there. Hmm. You've got offspring, yes? Yeah. What do you got? I've, I've got a 10-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son. And th their personal education in history, how's They're it going? It's, in my daughter's case, it's going pretty well because she's interested. Um, I think we've, we've, we sort of caught her early when she was hooked with horrible histories with the Oregon Trail and Mission U.S. during the, the long pandemic lockdowns. Um, she reads historical fiction. Um, so she's she, into it. She's into it. She, yeah, she gets it. And she was, she was delighted. She's in grade five now when she got to grade four because this was the first time that she got to do history beyond Canada's borders. She got to learn about, you know, embalming and the pharaohs and the pyramids and so on. Um, she liked that. She loved it. And I think, you know, and she's not unusual. This is, the, this is the thing. I think that there is a sense that, you know, kids sort of at a certain age are only equipped to process so much information, so much history. You talk to a kid about, um, I don't know, Pokemon or Star, Star Wars, they've <laughs> got an infinite capacity uh, to retain information, to build up that knowledge base. So, you know, if you can get them interested, um, you know, you've, you've got them for life. I mean, that is the thing, Christopher, right? Uh, Trilby says it in her book. There are people with an uh, unbelievable capacity to remember dates, episode names, character names, who did what to whom when, if it's about Star Trek or Star Wars. Surely they can do it about 1867 and all that, as your podcast is called. Yeah, they can. Uh, I, I've got four kids myself, some, one of whom absolutely loves history, has like almost encyclopedic knowledge of you know, Greek, Greek myth and, and Viking, uh, Viking gods. I actually have a, a, an incredible fan, a shout out to this uh, fan, a 13 year old girl who listens to my podcast and emails me just about every week, it seems, uh, and just has an incredible, must have an incredible knowledge of Canadian history. They can learn it they, and, and they're fascinated by it. I know that my podcast is being used in some independent schools as, as the history curriculum. And in fact, as kids as, as young as seven or eight, like it's kind of astounding. Uh, and I, I'm also used it to teach in university. Uh, so. They're fully capable of understanding it if it's kind of taught in the right way and taught in a kind of accessible way uh, from a very young age. And and they'll like it. They'll, who doesn't like the Egyptians? You know, it's that little tool to stick the stick up the nose to pull the brains out. I mean, everyone, <laughs> everyone loves that story. Okay, that's pretty gross for a family show here. But anyway, okay, I get you. We've got a couple of minutes to go here, and I want to get from each of you a recommendation: a book, a movie, a course, a game, a something that are people watching or listening to this can, um, can go source right after this and learn a little more about history. Something you love. Anthony, fire away. Three. Chris has one. The, the, the example of George H. Cartier is perfect because instead of just talking about here's a paper-pushing bureaucrat who helped make a deal, you've got a guy with a duel at dawn. Like he brings personality to it. The thing about Trilby's book, in addition to the ideas that she's brought forward, is it's written in this nicely breezy, which yes. I mean is a compliment, conversational matter where you can pick it up, you can go through a couple of pages, digest it, come back, think about it further. And the final, why not plug our own, is of course you know the Heritage Minutes. You know, we put out the Canadian Encyclopedia, has more than 20,000 articles in both official languages. We have about 16 million unique users a year, and it has gone way up, Steve, in views during the pandemic, proving again people want historical context to what's going on now. Chris, yours, please. Uh, my favorite thing right now is, is, is uh, The Rest is History, a British history podcast, which covers, there were two British guys, but they cover, you know, world history. Funny, funny, great stories. And plug your own podcast, too. What the heck? Oh, yeah, you can, you can always listen to 1867 and all that, a podcast, which is really just about making, making history fun and interesting and, and telling important stories in, in hopefully interesting ways. Great. Christina. The Secret Life of Canada podcasts, uh, CBC podcasts, mm. un untold and undertold stories of Canadian histories really resonate with my students and, and myself as well. Uh, they have, you know, very small shout outs to trailblazers that, you know, we may not have heard of or uh, may have heard of, but, you know, have an opportunity to learn more about them and also the much longer versions of all kinds of histories uh, across this land.
Trilby, I'm not going to let you answer this question <laughs> because oh, you're far too modest to plug your own book, so I'm going to plug it for you. The Vanishing Past, Making the Case for the Future of History is Trilby Kent's contribution to this. And do me a favor, say hello to your mother, Scylla, for me. She is <laughs> just such a great fan of this program, and I love her emails. I will, for sure. Oh, and say hi to that daddy of yours, Peter Kent, as well, because uh, he's not a bad guy either, even, yeah, if you didn't, even if you didn't mention him in your own book, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, can I thank our guests for coming on to this program tonight? Trilby Kent, Anthony Wilson-Smith, Christina Ganev, history, social studies teacher, coach, TDSB, and Christopher Dummett, on the line from Trent University in Peterborough, professor of Canadian studies. I thank all of you for joining us around the uh, actual and virtual table here on TVO tonight. Thanks so much, everybody. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.